a show about some of my favorite things coming up right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, I want to focus on some things that I'm really into, I really enjoy, some of my favorite things, like the holidays. We're going to focus on things both inside the house as well as in the garden. I have a friend visiting from Winnetour in Delaware to discuss the antique furniture I've acquired over the years here in the house. Plus, we'll take a walk around the garden and take a look at some of the structures I have outdoors. I'll also share with you some of my favorite fruits and vegetables from the garden. There's so much to see and do in today's show, so why don't we get started? I want to introduce you to my friend Tom Savage from Winnetour in Delaware. Tom, probably the largest piece in the house is this corner cabinet. Um, it comes from Boone County, North Carolina, and on the back it's actually dated 1794. Fantastic. You live so easily with the past. What I love about Moss Mountain is the fact that I'm not certain if I'm in a 21st century house or an 1840s house. <laughs> well, that's a great compliment. You know, I really try to, to, to take what's old and might be considered precious I, I like to make it useful and, and this cabinet has been very useful to me because I have a collection of green colored dishes but uh, they display so well with the color of the wood of the cabinet against the green color of the wall. Well I see white here and a chair I recognize from my Charleston days. This is a reproduction of a piece in the Aiken Rhett House in Charleston. It is. It's one I think they discovered in the kitchen. Um, I think it's patterned after an English hall chair. Um, and it's solid wood and you know I love the color it's sort of a creamy creamy white and even though it has uh, certainly historical roots um, it is very modern looking. Well and speaking of color one of the things that struck me as we drove up to the farm your Windsor benches and chairs painted that brilliant orange of course Windsors were almost always painted we know them now refinished into uh, something they never were, but you chose a bright color. Tell me about those. Well, I just thought it would be fun, again, to have the pattern, the, the form of the Windsor, which goes way back in American history, mm -hmm. and take a, take a really shocking color and apply it to it. Well, and a perfect furniture form for you to own because Windsor's moved into the house and outside the house as needed. Well, I'd love to show you this piece in the hall, a sideboard that I found, which I love. It's one of my favorite things. Fantastic. For years I'd been looking for a sideboard that had legs, a very leggy piece, and I discovered this in Tennessee. It was made in Maryland, and it's the kind of piece of furniture that no matter where I live, I want to take this piece of furniture with me, but I think it, it works so well with contemporary things. Absolutely, and what, what a great thing. It's not just for a dining room. This form was made very often in Scotland, and they did these double decks so you could get more stuff on it. <laughs> but I love the stuff you've chosen to put on. Now these are... Yeah, these would be just, you know, hotel silver, nothing fine. Uh, they were bought at a flea market. And what I like to do is just fill them up with, you know, well, in this case, Granny Smith apples. Well, it's, it's about the juxtapositions. I love these 1930 sconces. They sort of speak to both classicism, but the Art Deco period as well. Yeah, you know, mixing things up, I don't know, just seems to add a certain spirit to a place. And, and getting hung up on a particular time period feels so limiting to me. Well, you're the best ad I know for living with history in a modern way and making it all a lot of fun and very comfortable. Well, it's all about comfort, Tom, and thank you for being here. Thank you. I love to grow all kinds of leafy greens, lettuce, and certainly spinach, and that's what I'm planting here. You see, I try to get two crops of spinach out of the garden every year. Spinach is a cool weather crop, so I plant it in the very early spring and also plant it at the end of summer and beginning of fall because it makes a great fall crop. Now what I'm sowing here is a hybrid called Teton and this will germinate in about seven days. There's enough seed in one pack 
to plant a row about 50 feet long, but what I'm doing is I'm sowing the seed about two and a half feet across like this by about four feet long. And then I'll just gently cover the seed uh, with just a little bit of soil, not much, about a half an inch is all I really want to put on it. And all I did here was till the soil up with the tiller and loosen it. Now, once these germinate, I may do a little bit of thinning, but the idea here is for this to grow into one big spinach patch and I can pick the greens for salads and also I can freeze it to use it throughout the winter. And the great thing about spinach is that it can take more, well, cold temperatures than you might expect. That's why I like to plant different varieties because there's subtle differences in these hybrids. So while I'll have a row here of Teton, I'm gonna follow up with some Lonsdale, and then beyond that, one called Matador, and then a few others. And by having that variety, that diversity in the garden, and by being able to cover it with some winter cover, I may be able to bring my crop right into the first of the year. If you've never grown garlic, it's one of the most satisfying and easy plants you can grow and one of the most useful in the kitchen. Now what you're seeing here is the garlic harvest. We're right here at the beginning of summer and it's time to get this out of the ground. You see it's important to get it out sooner than later once those bulbs have reached a mature size and the foliage begins to show some wear. Once a third of it dies back, it's time to pull them up. Now that's the end of the story. The beginning of the story really started back in the fall. You see, we planted these rows of garlic back then and they wintered over. What we did is we worked up a wide ridge about 18 to 24 inches wide. And as you can see from the adult garlic that we're harvesting today, we did three rows on this ridge. Now, what you plant is actually the cloves of a garlic bulb. You just break it up and those little individual cloves you just push into the ground. You want to cover them with about an inch of soil and then in just a matter of really 10 days to two weeks you'll begin to see these grass-like blades coming up and that's the baby garlic. Now you don't have to go without garlic until now. What you can do is you can actually harvest the tips of those blades and use green garlic or young garlic in your cooking. And then in the summer well, it's time to harvest these beautiful bulbs. And remember, there are lots of different varieties of garlic out there. All have slightly different qualities and flavors. So give some of them a try. You'll be glad you did. You can always tell it's summer when it's time to start digging potatoes. It looks like we're gonna have a bumper crop this year. We planted lots of varieties, but, um, this one is one of my favorites. It's called a Superior White. It was introduced uh, from the University of Wisconsin in 1951, and it's a real favorite of um, chefs, particularly for, for boiling. It's also used in the potato chip industry. It makes a great potato chip. Isn't that right, Angel? Angel's out here to help me dig potatoes. Now, it's important that you get potatoes out of the ground as soon as the vines begin to die down, and you can see these vines are beginning to, to show signs of wear, so it's time to get the potatoes out, otherwise they'll begin to rot. You don't want them rotting in the ground. Now these potatoes will keep moderately well. What we'll do is we'll store them in a cool, dark place, and we'll probably eat these before some of the other varieties that we have out here. Some of the others keep longer, so we'll start with the ones that don't keep quite as well. So with these superior whites, what I'm going to do is make a delicious potato salad with them because it's one of summer's all-time treats. Now when we planted these potatoes, it looked very different out here. It was still winter, essentially. It was in early March, and what we did is we threw up these long rows and heaped up the soil, and then in the center of them planted pieces of potato. And all you have to do for each of these potato plants is have a piece of a potato that has an eye or a couple of eyes and then drop them in the ground and step on them, push them down, and then over the course of the next 90 days, what you end up with are uh, seven to eight, sometimes 10 potatoes under each one of these plants. And if you look behind me, you'll see the next generation coming on, not potatoes, but winter squash that are being planted in this area as soon as the potatoes come up. I think I've certainly got enough here for some potato salad. Now I'm gonna wash them up and they'll be ready to, to bring into the kitchen.
I have to say, it's really difficult for me to pick my favorite fruit because honestly, I love them all. But blackberries are exceptionally high on my list. Fred Simmons is the co-owner of Simmons Plant Farm, and he tells us more about this delicious berry and how to plant them. All right, we're here today to talk about Rammels. Rammels is a thorny plant that uh, is part of the rose family, and it's a perennial. It means which these plants will come back year after year. It does not like a clay-based soil. You'll have problems if you have a lot of clay in your soil. But you can put peat moss and build your soil, stuff like that. But it grows in most states in the United States. The blackberries does real easy. These are Worcestershire plants. Uh, they're a little smaller berry than the other varieties. If you wait till the blackberries are solid black, that's the sweetest that when they are. If you pick them a little red, they will not ripen any further. So you just want to make sure you pick them when they're solid black. To get these plants started, you need first of all till your ground up good and get the soil loose. These plants here started when they was probably about six inches tall plants and when you start to prune them you can prune them anytime after your, all your berries are gone. We usually wait till October, November when it's a little cooler and we'll go in here and and prune these. Uh, I'll show you how what we do here. We usually just take clippers in here. When you start to prune them you can tell the difference by the brown canes compared to the green canes. The green canes are what you'll pick on next year and the brown ones are what you will cut out. You just go in there and cut them as close to the ground as you can and you just pull them out out here and take them to your compost area or just take them out of your field you know. Uh, two of the most important things uh, after you plant your plants is to keep them watered especially the first year. Drip irrigation, overhead, uh, even if you just got in your garden, uh, just a soaker hose would be ideal to keep them uh, moist, keep the roots moist. And uh, you must keep the weeds out of front and uh, keep the grass out of front, especially the first year. Fertilize, we don't recommend uh, when you first plant them to put fertilize in the hole with your plants. We recommend after you see some good growth start, about maybe six weeks after you plant them. We really feel like you need to fertilize more often and less fertilized because uh, young plants are, a lot of people burn their plants by putting too much fertilizer on them. And some of these, like these, won't be upright. Uh, first year, most of your blackberries will be more of a vine type raised to your side. After the first year, the second year, when the first tart come up, they'll come up like this right here and like here. Uh, we've had them get as big as your thumb, come straight up and, uh, you know, grow up to, uh, like we talked about earlier, seven, eight foot tall. But like I say, we recommend you pinch the tops of them out when they get five, six feet like that. They'll make new growth, come out wide. It's very important to trellis your blackberries too. Uh, we use a simple system as can be. We just use some steel posts and stuff like that down the line and take some nylon twine and run down each side. It's important this, that your vines don't touch the ground like some of these might touch the ground here but uh, that ruins your berries, so you want to keep them up and keep them in a nice, neat row down through there. Uh, these vines here grow up, you can just slide them back under. That helps hold out. If you don't, they'll lay where, right, out in the middle of your row, and it's just a lot easier to take care of your plants and harvest your berries if they're in a not, nice, uh, neat row like this in this. Using pine straw as a mulch in my garden has proven to be really beneficial. Not only does it look good, but it's helping my plants. Tom Cates is an expert on the benefits of using pine straw, and he tells us much more. Well, Tom, it feels like spring rolled in earlier this year. Uh, just a few weeks ago, if you could have seen these fields, they were just full of daffodils. Right, right. It's a good transition from a, a spot where you can reapply pine straw for your spring season. Uh, great opportunity here. Well, that's always a reminder for me. Once those daffodils begin to fade, it's time for us to start reapplying the pine straw. I, I really like the way I can just layer it on top of what I'd put on the year before. Yes, Alan, these boxwoods here, take the pine straw and just put a nice clean rolled edge on it. 
and it, it's just good clean lines. It's a great border. Well, you know, there's so many chores that we have to do in the spring. It Absolutely. just it can feel overwhelming. And so when, you, when you've got something that you can put down that's actually easy to apply, looks good, it, and, and works, it just makes the, the, makes the whole process that much better. Right, the ease of application on pine straw is, is very easy. Um, you can install it at your leisure. If you don't install it all at once, it, it holds well to put to the side and reapply it at a later time if you need to, if the weather comes in or, or whatever your needs may have. Well, you know, one of the things about this pine straw that I've always liked, Tom, is it, it, it really is a very green product. It is, Alan. Um, it's, it's a leaf, considered a leaf. It falls from the tree, a renewable resource. There's no ground up. You don't have to grind the tree up or any portion of the tree to get the product. Um, we take it one step further with when we remove the pine straw from the forest floor, we resupplement that tree with fertilizer because it does remove a portion of nitrogen from it. So it takes it one step further. Yeah, so, the, so in the pine straw or the needle itself, there is some nitrogen content. That's why my boxwoods look so good. Absolutely. Or one of the reasons. And, right. uh, and so when you harvest, you, you reapply some nitrogen to those, uh, I guess, those, those tree plantations. Correct, yes. It, it helps us yield a, a good needle, but more in fact, it's just being a good steward of the land. It takes it, takes it one step further. Well, you know, the, the building of this house, it was all about uh, trying to create a, a traditional house that looked like a home from the 1840s in the Greek Revival style, but do it all green. Right. And uh, so, you know, the, the, this particular material for bedding uh, all of the flower gardens around the house is a perfect fit given the philosophy of the house. Correct, it is a good application for pine straw. Even though it's green, I have to say as a designer, I just like the way it looks. That, that dark mahogany brown really makes my plants show off really well. Right, Alan, it, it, it sets it off. It puts the emphasis on the plants, not the mulch. I really appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having me, Alan. Just take a look at this Radiator Charlie's Mortgage Lifter. It's a heck of a name for a tomato, isn't it? This thing is an old-fashioned variety that was developed in the 1930s. Uh, the reason it got its name is that uh, Charlie was able to pay off the mortgage on his radiator shop, uh, $6,000 back in those days, and he sold the little seedlings for a dollar apiece. It's indeterminate, meaning that it will grow and grow and grow and grow as a vine. And you can see these are towering almost five, maybe six feet tall. What's wonderful about this is that they claim that the mortgage lifter tomato can be one to three pounds. Now we're not gonna get anywhere that size in this garden this year, but get something to aspire to next year. These plants will produce fruit in about 80 days. Now take a look at these. These are celebrities. These are a modern hybrid, if you will. Um, they produce a lot more fruit. Uh, they're very disease resistant and they begin producing in about 65 to 70 days. It is a determinate variety, meaning that it will only grow to a certain height, about three feet. And the fruit is consistently round and smooth. It's your classic tomato. It's a great tomato for canning. And you better believe I'm gonna make a lot of tomato juice and soup mix to can to put away for the winter. This time of year, it's really hot, but the tomatoes love it as you can see here. Now that doesn't mean there's no reason to get out there and start a fall crop. Certainly I plant these tomatoes as early as I can. I want the soil to be warm, but in the late summer, in August, I begin planting a second crop. And by October and early November, I'm bringing green tomatoes in, which will ripen indoors, and I can have tomatoes in early fall. So if the summer rolls around and you hadn't gotten your tomatoes in the ground, don't give up, get them planted so you can have some a little later in the season. As a garden designer, I look to 12 different principles of design to help me when I'm creating outdoor living spaces. And one of those is structure. Structures of all kinds. They use them to support both the functional and aesthetic purposes of the garden. You see, structures can also add a sense of enclosure. They can screen unwanted views and provide visual interest. 
If done effectively, they can represent an anchoring element, a firm point from which we can begin to absorb the richness and diversity of the entire space, plus articulate the transition between the house and garden. Adding structures such as these to your landscape can play many roles, but probably the most important is that it just enhances your enjoyment of your home and garden. Here in my studio, I take a look at photographs of houses and gardens that you send to me, and we look for ways to improve them. Today, we've got a beautiful house in North Carolina. Heather, the owner, tells me that the house faces south and that she uh, likes a tidier look, not too much the wild look for a garden, and would like lots of color, but understands that azaleas and hydrangeas may not do well out here because it's facing the south and gets a lot of sun, and I think that's very true. So let's just talk about the sun for just a moment. It's a little hard to tell what's going on over here, but I think if we could plant a shade tree that would give some protection from hot afternoon sun over here on the west to the house. It would help with your energy efficiency. And also it might be nice to come out here in the front and do sort of a big shade tree that might come up here in the way of a sugar maple. So both of these could be sugar maples. And you mentioned that you love dogwoods and things like that, Heather. You know, you could plant over here to the east where the light is a little easier on the plants, some Yoshino cherries, which would be gorgeous and bloom in early spring. Now, as far as the foundation planting goes, I don't think you have to do a lot. If you want some color, one of the best ways is to go with some of these new improved shrub roses. And what I would suggest is maybe adding a boxwood here because you've indicated that these are boxwoods all across the front. It looks like you've got some yews planted in here. And I would make a bed that would come off of this point here, sweeps around here. And I would plant that all in roses and then use catnip or nepeta planted around it, which would give you a frothy sort of lavender bloom. And I would go with a pale yellow rose, a white rose, or a really pale pink rose. And then what I would do is expand this bed here just a bit, Heather, and add roses there as well. So if you think about it, you're gonna have some roses all along here and some of these shrub roses all along here with the catnip blooming in front. And I would allow these boxwoods to grow up a little larger here, okay? Let those go on up. And then back here on this corner would be a great place for an evergreen holly like Nellie R. Stevens or something like that. So we're framing the house. We've got some shade trees in place to create visual interest and help with the energy efficiency. And you're getting color here across the front. I would also think about maybe adding a large container up here on the porch uh, for a big fern during the growing season and, and maybe repeating that here at the front door with some containers that are the color of your chairs and your door and so forth. I think all this comes together quite beautifully. It's a very handsome cottage. Good luck with your project. Ah, and dried lavender, the aroma of it, hey, it is definitely one of my favorite things. What we've done here is filled this mantle with greenery, pine cones, cinnamon sticks, bits of silver, apples, and of course, these bundles of dried lavender. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com. <laughs>